wanted to preach something about Australia Day and, and honor the day. Maybe uh, Wednesday night we'll have a Bible study about it. was thinking about being freeborn. Paul talked about being freeborn and the great privilege that came with that. But this is a good passage too, and we're not going to be disappointed today. John chapter 15, we took last week uh, a break from this Gospel of John with Brother Harrington being with us. So we'll come back into it here in verse number 9. Remember, we sp- spoke last time about the true vine, and Jesus is the vine, and we're the branches, and spoke about abiding. But verse number 9 down to verse number 17 uh, this morning. And before I read that out, can I ask again, are we doing okay on temperature? We can bring it down a little bit if we need to. Is it too hot? A little bit hot? All right. Brother Allen, would you do me the favor then of just, if you just switch it off and switch it back on for that one, it'll be set the way I've done this one. And uh, you've got that one going? Okay, good. You got it down at Antarctic High Fam. <laughs> You don't want that one on. Is that what you're telling me? It's on. It's good. Okay. Good. All right. What, and you've got the back one on Antarctic. Is that right? Antarctic with um, northern winds. Okay. Good stuff. I see fans going, I'm hot. And I, today I grabbed my suit jacket and I said, no way. Not doing it. All right, now I'm going to give you guys a fresh start. John chapter number 15, we're going to start in verse number 9, read down to verse number 17. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Well, Heavenly Father, again, we pray for your help and your blessing as we go through this passage of Scripture. It's such a, again, such a common passage. Been, it's been preached on so many times. I pray that you'll help us to draw out fresh truth, something that would feed the soul, that would confront us of our need, that would make us to be more like the Lord Jesus, and that would draw sinners to you. And I pray, God, that you would do what only you can do. I know that I'm not able, but I know you are, and I know your word won't return void. And I pray that you would let all of these things work together today to bring about Uh, your exact and perfect will in our lives. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in the previous passage of verses 1 through 8, Jesus again taught his disciples about being the true vine and the branches. And was the subjects there, sort of a dual subject, but about abiding and as a result of abiding, that that would bring about fruit bearing. But in this passage that we look at today, Jesus is going to teach his disciples primarily on the subject of love. Now, abiding and fruit bearing, are they're not abandoned. He didn't just uh, suddenly change subjects, and we'll find those laced through this. But rather, there's a definite shift of emphasis onto the subject of love. And as Jesus teaches on love, it's clear that the love of the disciples is illustrated and dependent on the love of the Father and the love of the Son. We can see that clearly. They're all intertwined together. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk today about love. I mentioned a little bit of it there just in giving the announcements that somehow today love has been redefined, that if you really love me, then you'll make me happy. Uh, and, and really, that's, that's not 
just not what Jesus teaches about love. Um, love is often mistaken as lust, and uh, the, the, the problem of fornication that we have in our society today, and, and people want to relabel that as being love, and it's not love, it's sin, it's wicked in the eyes of God, it's fornication. God has a lot to say about that sin in the Bible. Love is not just allowing someone to do whatever they feel like doing. So the, the world has taken love and twisted that. And unfortunately, many of our young people have grown up in that environment and adopted their way of thinking to be the world's way of thinking. So let's readjust that as we go through this passage. Last time I showed you that, that there was a series of threes in verses 1 through 8. And interestingly, there's another series of threes, three sets of threes in this passage of verses 9 through 17. I want to just point those out just again for your own study and your own edification. The first three that we find here is, is their uh, love, the subject of love. There's the love of the Father mentioned, the love of the Son mentioned, or the Lord Jesus, and then the love of the disciple. All right, so that's the first of the series of threes. The second one is a series of three similes, like and as. And these similes are found in verse number nine, where he says in verse nine, as the Father. And then we find the next one in verse number 10, where he says, even as I have kept. And then again in verse number 12 is the third one. He says in verse 12, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. So three similes in this passage. Uh, the, the illustrations, the definitive and clear and perfect examples that are given to us to follow. And the third set of threes that I found here is there's three statements made to us regarding uh, obeying the commands of the Lord Jesus. So by following Christ's commands, we find in verse number 10 that the disciple abides in his love. If we follow the commands of Christ, we abide in his love. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Okay? So that's the first of these uh, benefits that come from following the commands. The second one is that Jesus' joy remains in the disciple and the disciple's joy is full. I've put those as being one. They're united together. That's found in verse number 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So as a result, he says these things, that's a result of these commandments. If you obey the commandments, you get that joy. And the third of these is in verse number 14. And he says, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. So here, the disciple is said to be the friend of the Lord Jesus Christ by obeying those commands. So it's an interesting, again, series of threes that we find. Three, three sets of threes in verses 1 through 8 and three sets of threes in verses 9 through 17. And again, that's just for you to digest and think about. Uh, and maybe it'll help you too as you study your Bible to just pick up on things like that. So interesting, the depths of the riches of God's Word. And you can study it all of your life and still not uh, even scratch the surface of the, uh, of the marvel of the Word of God. So what do we want to learn today then? Let's just go ahead and get right into this. What do we want to learn? I, I, I hope to, firstly, if you're not saved, if, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior today, I hope by the end of this message you are running to Christ and trusting Him as your Savior. I, I really... Uh, I don't know in a, in a message how more clearly the love of Christ can be explained than it is here. But for those of us that are saved, uh, there, is a, there is a certain requirement of us. And I want us to both love, learn and understand and practice love for one another in the same way that the Father and the Son loved toward us. Okay, And that's my purpose today. Only two main points today. Firstly, abiding in love abiding in love, verses 9 through 11. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Abiding in love. And we see there in verses 9 and 10, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is described. Uh, the love of Jesus is, is going to be described, but it's, it's prefaced by the love that the Father had for the Son. Um, <clears throat> As the Father hath loved me. 
It was kind of interesting because I stepped back to think about what does the Bible actually say in regard to the Father's love for the Lord Jesus. And um, I'm going to show you three passages, but before that, I want you to just think with me. What was the love of the Lord Jesus, excuse me, of the Father for the Lord Jesus? What can we say about it just by thinking, using a little bit of scriptural common sense? I think we could say it was perfect love. Uh, God has perfect love. So his love for the Son would have been a perfect love. It was a limitless love. The eternal God does not have a boundary to his love. And so as he poured out his love for his Son, there would have been no limit to that. I think we could also say it's an unchanging love. Uh, I am the Lord, I change not, he said. Uh, his love is an unchanging love for his son. And I think we could point that out very clearly, even though those words may not be used. I think you could easily show that. It's a holy love. It's a holy love. Again, in contradistinction to what the world has as a definition of love, I think we could easily, again, point out that the love of the father for the son was a holy love in, in absolute purity. And so on and so on, I think. Uh, you could probably continue that list yourself. But here's what the Bible says. I want you to keep your finger here and go to John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. <clears throat> now, the reason I even thought to do this is that if Jesus says, as the Father loved me, even so, you know, I love you, then don't we need to have a grasp of what that is? And so John chapter 10 in verse number 17, I'm going to do these a little bit out of order, but notice here, John 10, 17, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. So what do we find? What is the scripture saying here? The love of the father for the son is hinging on the fact that the son was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. In that passage, John chapter 10, I'm willing to lay down my life for the sheep. So the love of the father uh, was, if, I, I don't think conditional is the, the right word to use here, but I don't really know a better word to use. There was a condition of this. It's got to be a sacrificial, what you're doing has to be sacrificial. It can't be self-centered. And so the love of the Father for Jesus wasn't because of a self-centeredness of Jesus Christ, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all right? It, it was based on what the motivation of Jesus was. Now, there's a second thing here. Go back to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. And in John chapter number 3, I want to see verse 35. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into His hand. So what was, the, what was the love here? The Father's love for Jesus is displayed by committing some things into the hand of the Lord Jesus to be responsible for as a steward. So here we see that the love, again, it gives. This love for the Son, it gives. It gives responsibility. It gives a little bit of authority in that. Do you understand what, I, what I'm getting to here? It helps us to understand what is Jesus' love for us going to look like. And there's, so there's a selflessness to it, but the love of the Father for the Son was, here's some responsibility. I'm giving these things into your hand. There's a reception that comes from it. And the last one I want you to see is in chapter 5. Chapter number 5. Now, I realize maybe you were expecting this to look a little bit different than this, but this is all that it has to say about the love of the Father for the Son. Uh, John chapter 5 and verse number 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. So once again, because of the love that the Father had for the Lord Jesus Christ, not only did he commit some things to him, but he was showing him all things. Now, as you come back to John chapter 15, you should see that begin to play out as you look at Jesus' love for the disciples. And there's commitments made. There's a request for us not to be selfish. And there's a revealing of all things. In fact, in verse 16, he says, uh, verse uh, six, 15, sorry, he says, I'm not going to call you servants. I'm going to call you friends because I'm going to show you what I'm doing. Do you understand? So we see that the love from the Father that flowed to the Son is going to flow from the Son to the disciples. Amen. All right? 
So what is that love like? Well, all of those things that we said, here's what the Bible says about it. These, the selflessness, the, the giving of things, giving of responsibility, and then the showing of what's taking place. So Jesus loved his disciples in this same way. We see in verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, that was his example, so have I loved you. I, I know that because it's the Lord Jesus that you would say, well, these things couldn't be true of him because that's not his nature. And I understand that that's the case, but he becomes our example. And what I noticed is this, firstly, is that Jesus didn't simply revel in the love of the Father and absorb it for himself, but he took it and passed it on. And the second thing I notice is that all of the truths that are applied to the Father's love for Jesus are going to then also be true in Jesus' love toward us. I'll get a little bit ahead of myself, but think about it. Jesus' love for you and I, it was a perfect love. It, absolutely a perfect love. It was a limitless love. It was an unchanging love. It is a holy love. It's a love that commits to us. It's a love that shows us. It's a love that requires of us selflessness. So here comes this stream of love from the Father through the Son down through to the disciples. And so he says there in verse number 9, Continue ye in my love. Continue. The word continue is interchangeable with the word abide. But there's, there's even a, a slightly different definition to it. And I want you to just think of it in this vein. <clears throat> Stay in fellowship with. Stay in fellowship with, continue. And this is what he's referring to here. Remember, I said that chapter number 15 is going to deal with the subject of fellowship at different facets and aspects of it. And here's what he's saying. Continue in the love that you, you're going to be shown. Stay there. Stay in fellowship with it. Continue ye in my love. Now, the disciples here, if you want to say they're exhorted or commanded, or urged, it's up to you how you want to look at this. I think any one of those three could be said. But to continue, they are being told here, you need to continue in the love that Jesus has for you. Now, what this is not is it's not a threat, and it's not a manipulation. That is, Jesus is not saying, if you don't do what I say, I won't love you anymore. <laughs> right? L little children do that. Uh, immature people do that. If you don't do as I say, then I'm just not going to love you anymore. That's an immaturity. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. Again, Jesus' love is a perfect love. It's not based upon emotion, how he feels about you on the day. And thank God for that. Amen. How many times have we let him down? And we can finish that day still pillowing our head, knowing that his love hasn't changed for you and I, even though we've let him down. So it's not based on emotion. It's not, it's not even on our personal merits. This is why I preach to you all the time that you don't have to go about trying to make God or make Jesus love you more. That's not even in the book. How, how are you going to improve upon the perfect love of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and I? Yeah. You're not going to merit that. It's not on our personal merits. If he loves us on merit, it's on his merit that he loves us. So we don't have to go about trying to earn just a little bit more love from God and a little bit more love from Jesus Christ. You have all of it that he can give to you. As a believer, you've got it all. So what does this mean then, continue in my love? Well, I know this. Um, <clears throat> they could remove themselves. They could remove themselves from experiencing the fullness of the love that's coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way. He said you need to walk circumspectly. Every day needs to be monitored that we're walking in fellowship with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God. Our lives need to be manifesting that we care about what God says, and we are trying to do what He said in our life. We need the Spirit of God to do that. Amen? You've got to have the fullness of the Spirit of God to please God. But you and I can remove ourselves from that love. Now, this passage is not primarily about salvation. I can't remove myself from the love of God and lose my salvation. That's not what he's referring to here. He's telling his disciples, you need to stay in that place of blessing. That place that, you know, under the spout where the glory comes out. 
You need to get yourself to that place and stay there. Walk there. Abide there. Continue there. And so the question is going to come as he progresses through the passage, how do I do that? So verse number 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Is he not already answering that question even before it can be asked? There is one condition. Keep his commandments. Now in a day when, uh, when I, we just live... A, a bung, among a bunch of rebels. Amen. We're just, rebellion is at a peak. Amen. Everyone wants their own way, wants their own time, their own interpretation, Amen. right? I, and I'm talking about even in Christian circles. Um, one of the silliest things, and and I've, I've 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 heard of this happening. I've witnessed it happening. Is in a Bible study and going around. Well, what do you think that means? 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 It means what it says. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter if I'm preaching the Word of God to you from the pulpit week after week, and and I'm telling you just what I think. Well, I'm failing you. The goal of preaching and teaching the Bible is to, is to make sense of it, to give the sense of what it says, and to make application of it. Well, we live in the midst of a, of a rebellious, stiff-necked people. And when I say that the way to continue or abide in the love of Christ is to obey the commandments, there's something inside of us that says, hang on, you're putting a condition on this? Well, I want you to know that obeying the commands of Christ, that's what we called in bull riding the sweet spot. When I, and I only rode a few bulls, so don't think more of me than's true. But um, when, when you ride a bull, there's, the, there's this spot that you want to get yourself into uh, as that thing's spinning around, the sweet spot. And if you can get in the sweet spot, it's just like riding a little, it's like a little merry-go-round, <laughs> okay? You get outside of the sweet spot, everything goes pear-shaped. I'm here to tell you. All right, I got a limp as a result of getting out of the sweet spot. So, when, we're, when, when we want to abide in the love of Jesus Christ, we want to be in the sweet spot. Right there where it's like just a, it's, you're just being carried along and just carried along in the love of Christ. Now, he said before in chapter 14 that if they loved him, they would keep his commandments. And so this keeping of the commandments is doing two things. It's illustrating that the love that the disciple has for the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's also keeping us so that we can abide in the love of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Do you see it? This, this uh, obeying the commands of Christ, abiding in that place, is the sweet spot. It's the guarantee that you and I can be in the love of Christ at all times. And I want you, if, if your nature is like mine and your rebellion flares up as a result of being told that if you want to abide in the love of Christ, you have to do what you're told. If you're like me in that regard, I want you to get that mindset out because that's not what he's referring to. It's not like that. What he's saying is, this is about your fellowship with me. I want you to be in fellowship with me. Can two walk together except they be agreed? If God has commands for us and we're not going to walk in them, how can we possibly be in fellowship with him? If Jesus Christ gives commands and we're not going to walk according to those commands, how can I say that I'm even in fellowship with him? It's not possible. And that's exactly what the Apostle John wrote in 1 John. It's not possible. So instead of thinking of it from the perspective, the negative side that says this is like making demands on me that are unreasonable, we need to look at it from the other side, the positive side, and say these are the, these are the things that I can do. I can get a hold of these and do these and stay in this place of the love of Christ. And so the condition here of if 
is stated simply because it's the duty of the disciple. It lies with you and I, brethren, whether or not we are abiding in the love of Christ. If, he said, ye keep my commandments. He didn't say, you must, and I'm going to twist your arm and force you to it, as though he's a Calvinist and says, you don't have a choice in the matter. It's not at all what it is. This is, I'm giving you a free will option here. You can take the choice. You can either be obedient or you can be self-willed and disobedient. If you want to abide in the love of Christ, then put yourself in the place of being obedient to the commands of Jesus Christ. You can choose to do so. I'm not going to force you, but it's certainly what I desire. That's what he's saying. Well, I don't think you should put a requirement on us like that. Jesus, I don't think that's reasonable. I'm going to give you the example. That's his response in the second half of verse number 10. Now watch the whole verse. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I. There's the example. Even as I. Yeah, well, yeah, but he was God. Yeah, he was tempted in all points, like as we are. Given the opportunity, the devil himself, none of us have met the devil himself. The devil himself came to Jesus and said, do this, try this, why don't you say this? The opportunity put before Jesus and constantly, what did he want? I, I want to please my father. I'm going to do that by obeying the word of God. And so he'd quote the word of God back to him. Now he says, even as I've done this, you do this. Verse 10 again, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So by keeping the commandments of the father, Jesus was able to abide in the love of the father. Now you say, look, I just I don't see how this plays out in the life of Jesus. We know that he was God in the flesh and all that. He was he was 100% man, just like you and I are 100% man. Yes, he was 100% God, no doubt, but he was 100% man. So I want you to see now how the Bible shows us that Jesus let the commands of God govern his life. All right? Chapter 10. Look at John chapter 10. Are you guys okay this morning? Do you see where we're going? Jesus did not give to us a command that he himself didn't put himself under it as well. All right, John chapter number 10 and verse number 18. Uh, we better grab 17, sorry for context. Therefore doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Watch. Watch. This commandment have I received of my Father. Do you know what I learned? The Father's commandments governed Jesus' actions. I'm going to lay my life down and take it up again because that's what the Father told me to do. And I'm willing to do it. I want to do it. I volunteer to do it because I want to remain in the love of the Father. Do you understand? Jesus' actions are governed by the commands of God. Now watch verse, uh, chapter number 12. Chapter number 12 of John, <clears throat> excuse me, and verse number 49. John 12, verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment that I should say, excuse me, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting whatsoever I speak. Therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. The second thing that the Father's commandments governed in the life of Jesus were his words. My actions are governed by what the Father told me. My words are governed by what the Father told me. But he's not done. Chapter number 14. Chapter 14, book of John, chapter 14, verse number 31. All right, I want to grab verse 30 again for context, but 31 is where we want to grab our, our point. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. His decisions 
His decisions were governed by the commands of the Father, and we see that as we pointed out when we went through that passage, arise, let us go hence. He made a decision to proceed on in the will of the Father, which was going to take him to Calvary, that was going to take him to the mocking and all that went with it. So there's three things that were governed by the commandments of the Father in the life of the Son as he dwelled on this earth, his actions, his words, and his decisions. Now look at chapter 15 with me again. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Jesus considered the commandments of God of paramount importance. Remember, in John chapter number 4, he said, the meat that I have is the meat of doing the will of God, the will of him that sent me. That's my food or did somebody give him something to eat? They asked as they came back from that town in Samaria. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He, uh, he, he said in John chapter 8 and verse number 29 that he knew that to, to do, I do always those things that please the Father. He knew that if he wanted to please the Father, it was going to be directly related to the commands of the Father. So let's grab this truth out of here. Having set the example, it's clear that the disciples need to have the same regard for his commands. Can I just ask, is everybody with me today or are we still together? Okay. If Jesus, the perfect son of God, had such a regard for the commands of the Father, then he says, I want you now to carry that on as my disciples and I want you to have the same regard for my commandments as I had for my fathers. And I stayed, I, I continued, I was abiding in the love of the Father, and so you'll abide in my love if you do these things. The commandments of the Lord Jesus, and, and at that, the, the commandments of God, they need to govern our actions. There should be nothing that we do in life that isn't governed by the commandments of our Savior. They should govern our words, how we speak to one another, how we speak to the unsaved, how we speak about people when no one's around. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Remember, Peter and Jude both spoke about those who spoke evil of government. I know we don't like it, and I know we don't like directions that they're taking and decisions they're making, but in both passages, that evil speaking of government was condemned as being the speech of ungodly, unsaved people. We better have our words governed by the Lord Jesus and by the Word of God. Our decisions. Uh, when I say every decision we make, I know some people go, oh, what, whether I'm going to have a hamburger or a hot dog for dinner? And I've had people say that to me, and I just have to say, come on. We know what we're talking about. The decisions to fulfill the word of God, the will of God in our life. Every decision should be geared this way. How does this help me, designed as God's made me, to fulfill his will? I think maybe one of the most profound things that God's helped me to understand more and more clearly over these last several months is that I need to know what God made me for. Amen. What is his design for me? And then how does that fit in where I'm at in my life and where I'm headed? Every decision I make should fit somewhere in that fence line, that context of this is what God made me for. And so when we do this, when we obey the commands of the Lord in our life, he says, when you do that, you're abiding in my love. I tell people this all the time because sometimes the will of God <clears throat> can become something that's a little bit evasive and sometimes difficult for us to know and understand. And we can get to a place of paralysis, <laughs> analysis paralysis. We don't want to make a decision because we're afraid if I get out of the will of God, he's just going to crush me and he's going to hurt me. That's not how God works. Amen. When my decisions, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, such simple passage of scripture that's so profound in its application. In all thy ways acknowledge him 
and he, and he shall direct thy paths. What if I make a wrong decision? You'll be okay. God's a good God. He's going to just keep on pushing you that direction that he wants you to be because you've acknowledged him in your ways. Your decisions, folks, need to be governed by the commands of the Lord. Rather than finding them as a, as a factors that limit us and restrict us and they keep us from a life of liberty and freedom. You, you know, Pastor Kevin, you're just a legalist and you have all these commands for us and they keep us from having fun in life. No, a thousand times no, just the opposite. Life and liberty and joy and happiness are found in obeying the commands of the Lord. We should consider these words to be more than our food, better than food. I've esteemed thy words more than my necessary meat, Job said. And the pathway of pleasing him. Brethren, I ask you to analyze your own life this morning, the decisions you make, the words you speak, the actions that you take, your, your reflections and your, your obedience to the word of God and the commands of Christ. I want you to just step back and analyze that and, and ask yourself this, have I done these things that I do and have I done that simply because I want to please him? And it may not be pleasing to me, but it pleases him. There's a truth that I wish I could have chased further, but we would just get far too much into the depth of this study. But the, the link between love in the Bible and commandments if all you do, do yourself a favor, go home and read the, the first epistle of John, 1 John, and look at the link between love and commandments. Commandments aren't to rob us of love. They're to make sure we abide in love. So what is the benefit of doing this? You know, and, and isn't this the way humans think? What do I get out of it? Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you because I'm a mean ogre and I want to keep you under my thumb and I never want you to have a smile on your face ever again. If yours says that, you got the wrong version. Amen. These things have I spoken unto you that. Do we not understand it as so that? That my joy might remain in you. Who could have better joy than the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ? And that your joy might be full. What do we get out of it? The abiding, continuing joy of Jesus in us. And the fullness of our joy. And once again, we can't go too far into this, but notice how love and joy are linked in the Bible. Amen. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of Christians who aren't joyful Christians. And so if we just step that backward, you know where we end up? We come to the source of the problem. And it's not that your pastor's a legalist. It's not that he preaches too hard from the Bible. It's that your love for Christ is missing because you won't obey his commands. Kevin Byer is not robbing anyone of the joy in their life. I can't go into your heart and be a thief and rip that out of your heart. That's not even possible. The thief that's robbing joy from you is your disobedience to the commands of Jesus Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you want fullness of joy, keep my commandments. Was he trying to put them under some sort of a grievous bondage? Is that what he's looking at here? Again, we would say absolutely not. Rather, he wanted his disciples to be filled with joy. There is no doubt as we study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that he had great joy in obeying the Father. And so he takes that joy and he says, I'm offering you my joy if you'll do exactly as I've done. And you know, if you have the joy of Christ in you, you'll have fullness of joy. Because <laughs> he's got a lot more joy to go around than any, any of us can contain in one lifetime. <laughs> we need the love of Christ. We need obedience to Christ. And we need the joy to, of Christ. 
That's abiding in his love. And then the, the last set of verses here. Um, I want you to look at this subject with me, love for one another. Okay, so I started off by showing you that the love of the Father flowed into the Son, and the, the love of the Son flowed into his disciples, but it can't stop there. And in verse number 12, I'm just calling this the most difficult command because I think this is difficult. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Oh, In chapter 13, he said this, verse 34 and 35. He says, uh, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye love also one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, by the love ye have one for another. (laughs) So what does he do now? He revisits the subject and he says, Here's what I'm commanding you. Love one another. Oh, I find it tough. And I think if we're honest, you find that difficult. Loving the sinless Lord, uh, that's tough too sometimes because we're in our sinfulness and we get selfish, but it's comprehensible. We love him because he first loved us. Look what he did for us. Of course I would want to love him. But to turn and love one another with that same love, well, that's pretty tough. And I would say that it requires the supernatural spirit of God working through us to bring it to pass because we're not able to do it on our own. Now, having said that, he talks about the greatest love in verse 13. He gives them the most difficult command followed by the greatest display. Verse, Verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, you know as well as I do, you could preach a whole message on that. The greatest love, humanly speaking, is laying your life down for a friend. This type of love has no escape plan. It's final. Do you know what I mean by that? Sometimes we kind of put conditions on our love. And so we, we can have an escape route just in case we don't like the way it's going. We can get out of it. But when we lay down our lives for our friends, there's no escape plan. This greatest love, it reveals the ultimate in selflessness. And not disconnected to that, This type of love gives the ultimate expression of value for someone else. How highly do I value this person I call my friend? You read stories of wartime heroes and men that laid down their lives, and it's pretty remarkable. without even what seems to be without thought at all to step in front of one of their brothers in arms to give their life and save the friend, jumping on grenades to save those around them. There's a lot that takes place in wartime that brings this out. And when you read those stories, you can't help but wonder what in the world... Was that established in a, in a moment of time? And I would say to you, no, not at all. But something had grown inside of them that they said, I value the life of that person more than I value my own life. Greater love hath no man than this. Because your life is worth more to me than my life is worth to me. You don't make a decision like that flippantly. This is a measured action because you, you, you place more value on someone else than you do yourself. Well, again, Jesus gives us the example, doesn't he? Even though it's not spoken here, we know the rest of the story. The disciples 
undoubtedly came back to this statement after the death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection. And I think about here, if you want to just turn quickly to Romans chapter 5 with me, as the Holy Spirit lays this out for us plainly in Romans chapter number 5. Because Jesus said that humanly speaking, you couldn't have a greater love than to lay it down for your friends. But then we find that there's a supernatural love that went beyond laying it down for his friends. Now, he laid it down for his disciples, and they were his friends. That's what he told them. But that's not all he died for. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse number 7 that for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. So we would consider giving our life for someone that we consider righteous. And he says even about a good man in the same verse, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare uh, to die. So there would maybe be a little hesitation there, but that's a good man and I'll die for him. Oh, but the Lord Jesus... Verse 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, we weren't friends, Christ died for us. You look at verse number 6, you know what it talks about? It, it describes us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. We're not friends, we're ungodly. We're sinners. And then look at verse number 10, for if... When we were enemies. He didn't jump on a grenade for his friends or even just for those that were on the same side as him. He jumped on it to save the life of those who threw it. If, if you just want a present day illustration. So he gives us in verse 13, the greatest love that you and I can show is to lay down our lives for our friends, but he says, I'm going to illustrate that. Not only am I going to die for you disciples as my friends, but I'm going to die for the rest of this world, and I'm going to do it as they spit at me, as they mock me, as they beat me, as they reject me, as they blaspheme my name. I'm going to die for them in the process of their ungodliness. They're my enemies, but I'm not their enemy. They've made themselves an enemy to me, but I have not made myself an enemy to them. It's remarkable. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. 1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's unbelievable. So who are His friends? Verses 14 and 15, Ye are my friends. And He is gearing this toward those disciples. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. But no doubt we can, we can tap into that as believers. I think, I almost get the sense that Jesus made this statement anticipating much like he would get from that lawyer that said, well, who is my neighbor? You know, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. All right, who's my neighbor? Ah, I see it coming. So instead of waiting for the question to be asked, well, then who is my friend? He just says, you're my friends. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Would you agree, you don't have to say or nod or anything to this, but in your heart, would you answer this? Would you agree that most professing believers today are willingly choosing to disobey one or more of Jesus' commands and thereby showing a lack of love and removing ourselves from friendship with Jesus Christ? You don't have to nod. You don't have to say anything. I'm not, I'm not trying to trap you. I just wonder if you would agree with that because I think about all that goes on. I, when, somebody, when someone is trying to convince me how much they love the Lord Jesus by saying it over and over and over again, I start to get really, uh, I don't know about that. You don't have to convince somebody 
If it's real in your life, it'll just show up. You don't have to try to twist people's arm and make them come your way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, they really love the Lord. How do you know? Well, because they told me. And they kept telling me. No. The commands of Christ. What if we dwelt there just the rest of the morning, if we dwelt on what we've been commanded to do? And we started making a list. Every one of us would start saying, oh, no, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. But let's just have one. Let's just have one. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Amen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. How are we doing with that? When you go home today, I want you to look on both sides of your home. And I want you to ask yourself, look across the street, look on both sides of your home. And I want you to ask yourself, if you're saved today, you're on your way to heaven. Somebody shared the gospel with you and persisted in praying for you and helping you so that you could be saved. Would you please just look at those people who live on either side of you and ask yourself, have I given them the gospel? And if I have, when's the last time I did that? When's the last time I prayed for them? Am I going? I want you to go to work this week, and I hope that in your heart you will be able to look at all of those people that you work with. And I am not asking you to defy your, the reason you're there. Please, i got to say this. You're at your job to work. Work your job. Okay? That's what you're getting paid to do. But have you even tried outside of those work hours? Have you even tried to tell those people you work with that they're condemned and on their way to hell without Jesus Christ and that Christ died for them? I'm glad we have a strong missions budget. I'm glad we give a lot of money to missions. But that's not going. That's supporting those who go. One command was given to us. Go. Well, I'm not called to go to a foreign land. You are called to go to the people you live near. Every one of us is. And there's no excuse for not doing it. I don't want people to come and tell me how much they love Jesus Christ and they can't give a gospel tract to someone behind a cash register. They can't stand with us on a street and and take some shame for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Suffer a little bit of shame and hold a sign that says, you love the Lord Jesus and he died for sinners. Folks, I don't want to hear that. I'm just saying this because I care about you. You and I do not love Jesus Christ if we're not doing what he told us to do. I am not talking about matters that we may be unaware of or unfamiliar of with or we don't know how to apply. I'm talking about the things that we know and we understand. We do not love him if we're not doing those things. And because of that, we're not abiding in his love. I dream of the day when we go door knocking and this number of people show up to go door knocking. I dream of the day when we go out on a street and this number of people show up for us to go out on the street. I dream of a day when every one of us can look at somebody in the room and say, I led that person to Jesus Christ. That's just one command. You know, friendship is a two-way street. Proverbs 18.24 tells us that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. I believe I have a truth here that I want to share with you before we close out today regarding this friendship. Because Jesus said, you're my friends if you do these things. I know that Jesus showed his friendship to us by laying down his life. But what about the other direction? You know, anyone in this room can be my friend without me being your friend and vice versa. 
Uh, sometimes you'll hear a preacher say friend as they, as they preach. Sometimes when we're on the street, we might say friends. And those people wouldn't say, you're not my friend. Yes, I am. Amen. <laughs> now, when I preach things here that might, they're biblical, but they make you mad, I'm your friend. You may not be my friend, but I'm your friend by telling you. You know, a friend is defined this way, one who is attached to another by affection. Oh, you know, I love that person who wants to punch me in the mouth as I give him a gospel track, but I love him enough to give him a gospel track and risk it. This person, this friend, this person is led, so they're, they're attached to another. The, the, the dictionary says this, this person is led to desire the company of the one for whom there is affection and seeks to promote his happiness and prosperity. When both parties are behaving as a friend, then there's friendship. So what did Jesus teach him? Here's, here's one direction of the street. One can show no greater love than laying down his life for those that he considers to be his friend. All right? Uh, let's take the military scene. Uh, I'm sure that more than one man has, has died on the battlefield giving his life intentionally and someone that he saved, he maybe wasn't that fond of, but he gave his life anyway. He was a friend to that man. Jesus, of course, uh, he performed this perfectly. But now what's the other direction? This is uh, Christ toward us laying down his life. Now what about us toward him? Obey my commands. Do you see it? This is the friendship that we can have with Jesus Christ. He showed himself to be a friend by giving his life for us. Now I show myself to be his friend by doing what he tells me to do. And when I do that, we have friendship. He says in verse number 15, I want to finish. Henceforth, I call you not servants. It's not that they weren't servants. And I'm going to do, I tell you, I got a lot of notes left, but I'm just going to. It's not that they weren't servants. And even the apostle Paul calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. They are servants, but what did he say? I'm not going to call you servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. That's what a friend does. They're not keeping secrets. They're saying, here's what the Father said. Here's what he requires of us. Here's what he wants us to do. Here's how he wants us to live out our life. Here's, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be sending you out. I'm telling you these things because I'm your friend. Verse 16. You have not chosen me. This is not a, a verse on their salvation. This is a verse on their discipleship, their apostleship. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. So what did he say? He said, you didn't come along and say, hey, I'll make you my master. He said, no, I was the master and I came and said, you're going to be my student. And then as I make you my student, I'm going to send you out so that you'll go bear some fruit. But even the fruit will be for your benefit because as you bear fruit and that fruit remains, you can ask the Father whatever you want and He's going to do that for you as you're in fellowship with Him. And I want to finish with verse 17, of course. And I've just put this in my notes. I just wrote this out. See to it. <laughs> See to it, verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. How many times does he have to say it? Amen. Love one another. The Father loved the Son. The Son loved the disciples. Now the disciples love the disciples. Don't let it stop with you. Love them. So uh, I say this all the time. There's so many things to say. I'm looking at my notes. Let the love continue to flow on. But if you choose and you say, look, I can do a lot of things, but I can't love that one. That brother, I can't love them. That's your choice. But you just removed yourself from the love of Christ. You're not continuing in his love. Because he said, I want you to do one thing. Love one another. Whew. 
I, I revisited that subject this morning in my morning devotions. I was thinking about how Peter said, Lord, if my brother offends me and he comes and he asks for forgiveness, how many times in a day does this have to happen before I've forgiven him enough? Seven times? And what did Jesus say? Until 70 times seven. And I had to revisit that in my devotions this morning in regard to this. And I think about how it's so easy for me to make excuse for why I choose not to love somebody by not forgiving them. Well, do you know how many times they've done this? Do you know how often I had to put up with that? And the Lord this morning in my devotion said, hey, do you want to abide in my love or not? Forgive them. And that's why I think that is the most difficult command. Love one another. Well, two subjects today, the subject of love and the subject of friendship. And I don't know which one or both if the Lord spoke to you about those today. But can I ask you to do this for me? I want to give us a silent invitation again for just a moment. Just give you a chance to respond if you like. So I'm asking you to, with heads bowed and eyes closed,